The ability to recognize what things are is a fundamental aspect of everyday life. Imagine for a moment if you couldn't tell the difference between what is food and what isn't food. Or for example, if you couldn't properly identify what a thing was, you could never functionally use it, let's say, like a tool. Object recognition is our ability to learn what things are, properly identify these things, and tell them apart from other things. And as we'll see in this video, we have, in our brains, the functional anatomy and computational network to achieve just that. Now, there's a whole bunch of related processes that are similar to, but not the same thing as, object identification or object recognition. For example, there's object tracking, where you follow an object through space. Or there's object searching, which would be where you kind of scan your surroundings uh, and look for the object, kind of like Where's Waldo. Uh, we're not going to be talking about these processes, we're going to be talking about object recognition. Not looking for Waldo, but the proper identification of him when you actually find him in the big mess of people on the page. So, to start off with a really simple example, there's this cup, but as far as you're concerned, it's just a thing in your visual field. And it's somehow different from everything else in your field of vision. It stands out, it looks like it's kind of made of different stuff, it has edges, it appears to be a distinct object. And by looking at it and its various features, like color, shape, texture, maybe it even has writing, we can identify what the object is, either through access to direct memory of the same object that we've experienced in the past, or in reference to other objects we've experienced in the past that are somewhat like it. So to start off, we know that the brain uh, is very well adapted to object recognition and it can do it fairly well because object recognition happens pretty quickly on the scale of hundreds of milliseconds. You don't have to sit around and ponder and think, you know, what is that thing? Usually when you see it, you know what it is almost automatically. So first, we'll go over some of the neuroanatomy, that is, where object recognition is thought to happen in the brain, and second, we'll go over some of the computational sides of how the brain actually solves object recognition. And don't worry, I know anytime I hear the word computational, I usually run away in the opposite direction, but it's fairly simple stuff, and hopefully I'll explain it in a way that's pretty basic and easy to understand. So let's get started. So first, I'll give a very brief description of the primary visual pathway in the brain, that is, how images from the outside world end up hitting your eyes and get into your brain in a way that you can process for object recognition. So, light from the outside world stimulates photoreceptors in the retina of your eye, and these are specialized cells that convert light energy into chemical signals used by neurons in the brain. This signal from the eye represents a very simple kind of raw neural signal, if you want, uh, of what you see from the outside world. This signal travels down what is called the optic nerve, crosses sides at the optic chiasm, which is a word meaning crossing, um, and is now called the optic tract. And this eventually ends up in the lateral geniculate nucleus, a specialized region of a much bigger complex of regions collectively called the thalamus, which we won't go over uh, much here, but it's very important in directing sensory information, such as light information from the eye, to the neocortex. And from here it goes, well, to the neocortex at the back of the brain in a place appropriately called the visual cortex. Now since this video isn't about the visual pathway but about object recognition, we're not going to cover the visual pathway in much detail. But just understand that it isn't a simple one-way stop from eye to cortex, but there's multiple stops along the way and the information gets changed in a bunch of interesting and important ways. Once this visual information has reached the visual cortex, it can be used for a whole bunch of things. Basically, Anything you can imagine vision would be important for. Some of the stuff we talked about before, like object tracking and object searching, guiding movements and walking, all sorts of things. But what we're going to be talking about is a very specific pathway involved in object recognition. And this pathway is usually referred to as the ventral stream. What we see here is called the ventral what stream. Called that because it's ventral, meaning under, as opposed to dorsal, meaning above, in anatomy terms, and it's called the what stream because of its involvement in determining what things are, as opposed to the dorsal where stream involved in the location of things. Now, the ventral stream is called a stream because of the flow of activity of information. Once the information from the eye reaches the primary visual cortex in the back of the brain, the information moves directionally, so 
down a stream across a variety of cortical brain regions. So, very briefly, the neocortex is a thin sheet of neurons at the top of the mammalian brain, seen here in blue, covering most of its surface area. Uh, what are called subcortical, or below the cortex, regions, feed information into the cortex. The cortex sends this information across itself to other cortical regions, processing it in what you might call making sense of this information in incredibly useful ways. And then it usually sends it back down to the subcortical regions and to the periphery for the execution of behaviors. The cortex is most often praised for its function in very high level behaviors, things like planning and coordinating, thinking, language, consciousness, social and emotional interpretation, and a whole list of very impressive things. So, what does this recognition stream consist of? Well, it consists of a series of distinct cortical brain regions. Each of these distinct brain regions are labeled as such, distinct, because of their anatomical connectivity with other brain regions and unique physical structure different from all of the other structures. Here we have a very nice picture produced by Nicole Rust in her 2012 paper entitled How Does the Brain Solve Visual Object Recognition? We know that visual information flows in this direction of the ventral stream because it's possible to time when neurons fire after presenting a visual stimulus, that is, presenting an image to the eye. What this means is that if I put a recording device in each one of these brain areas and then I show you a picture, this area will fire at 50 milliseconds, this one at 70 milliseconds, and this one at 90 milliseconds. And since it takes time for information to flow across the brain, this means that this area is activated first, closely followed by this one, and this one, and so on. So, in the cortex, it all starts with what's called primary visual cortex. And we can tell by the fact that it's called primary uh, that it's the first and also that there are other secondary and tertiary visual cortices as well. These usually take the short names of V1, V2, V3, and so on. Here we see information going from V1 to V2 and then to V4. From these visual areas, the information goes to a large portion of the cortex called the inferior temporal cortex. And it's called this uh, mostly because of its position in the brain. It's inferior, meaning below or under, and temporal, meaning on the side. And we see in this picture that it is located relatively low and on the outside of the brain. Here it's pictured in yellow. The inferior temporal cortex can be distinctly divided up into three sections, also separated by name and by where they're located. There's the posterior, or backmost, the central, which is fairly self-explanatory, and the anterior, or most forward. It's in these IT regions that the computational process of object recognition is proposed to take place. For example, if you damage the inferior temporal regions of the cortex of monkeys, and that's these yellow parts here, uh, you can basically get rid of the ability to distinguish objects from one another. The numbers on the sides of the colored bars represent millions of neurons in each of these brain regions. So there are lots of neurons at the start and relatively fewer neurons as we move along this pathway, and soon we'll go over why this is important and how it's relevant to how the brain solves object recognition. So now that we've talked a little bit about where object recognition happens in the brain, now we're going to talk about how it actually goes about doing this. One important thing to consider before we start is something called the invariability problem, and the invariability problem goes something like this. When we interact with objects in the real world, they almost never appear to us in the same way each time. You almost never get to see the exact same image of a cup in every single situation. What this means is that objects produce variable or flexible images to our nervous system, yet somehow we're capable of identifying these objects consistently, regardless of how they're presented to us. And as we'll see, the ability to do this requires complex cortical connectivity. To show why this is the case, Let's imagine that objects do in fact only appear to us in one single form in the real world all the time. If this were the case, then it would be possible to recognize objects simply by how they make impressions on our retina. So imagine that this is the back of your retina, the back of your eye, and that the cells that are activated by light are laid down across these two circles in a single layer. Basically, these two circles represent the back of your eye. When we see an object, 
the combination of changes in light and color activating our rods and cones respectively would come to represent the object we saw and because the object always appears to us in the same way this set of cells that have been activated would be all that would be needed to identify an object and we wouldn't really need any more of our brains to do this when it hits your retina you would recognize it as a car or a cup or a bird or whatever in the same way that a fingerprint scanner might recognize fingerprints it's just one version of a two-dimensional object or a picture and so you don't really need a whole lot of computationally heavy circuitry to do this but this isn't how things work in the real world because not only can we recognize this is a car uh, but this and this and this and even this the invariability problem can be solved by extensive levels of complex processing units in the brain not by a simple single cell layer like the retina and the perfect place for this to happen is the neocortex. So what I'm going to present to you now is a very simplified model or diagram of how the neocortex can go about doing just this. So an object that we see in the real world will activate our visual system and eventually a large number of neurons in the primary visual cortex will come to represent a very vague image with simple features such as there's a line here, there's not a line there. There's something here that is big and this shape compared to over there where there's nothing. These neurons project to other neurons farther down this ventral stream along the cortex. A bunch of possible neurons could be activated, but only ones with enough input from the first set in the visual cortex will be. So if we think about two things that look quite similar, but are not, let's say a dog and a table, you know, they're both brown, they both have four legs, they're both roughly the same size, but the sets of neurons down the ventral stream that will inevitably end up in the identification of a table will require a different set of inputs than the one for the dog. So the sets of neurons that represent the table won't be activated while the dog one will be uh, because there's more matching characteristics. One analogy that we could use is that of an organization or a company that is structured as a hierarchy. Bottom level employees bring in very basic information. I sold this much, I lost this much, and I did it in this region. The higher up managers collect and make sense of all this data, getting a picture of what is going on with everybody underneath him, and then send this report to higher up individuals, along with a report from other managers in other areas, and these individuals will have all the information they need to understand exactly what the state of their company is and where they need to go. And importantly, just as we talked about previously involving millions of neurons, um, there's lots of very simple employees few managers, and even fewer people above the managers. In the same way that there's lots of neurons involved in the primary visual cortex, fewer as you go up uh, this ventral stream. So in the ventral stream, you know, instead of sales, it's bits of information from the retina. And instead of managers and higher level movers and shakers, it's higher level cortical regions, processing lower level visual information in what we might call object codes. So in the cortex, the bottom level of this hierarchy might receive a whole lot of very basic information. It takes this input and creates its own more precise input. For the most part, neurons receive lots and lots of inputs, but very few outputs. They send very few outputs. In this way, the first level might receive millions of inputs, but only send, let's say, a thousand outputs. A large, less precise signal gets turned into a smaller, more precise signal. And this is proposed to happen at each level of this hierarchy until the final product is a small but very detailed neural code representing the object that you're seeing. Individual neurons will not know what the object is, but will simply process large amounts of individual pieces of information, probably related to very small aspects of that object. Maybe it's corner or something, but collectively thousands and millions of neurons all fine-tuning basic information into more precise information can create a mental representation of objects. So, how might this type of structure tackle the problem of invariance? Well, if all these lower levels are involved in very simple visual recognition and very simple visual information, uh, simple things rarely ever change between variants of the same object. If I show you of a picture of a car, uh, it doesn't really matter how you present it, there's still going to be 
you know, small circles called tires, and these uh, small square structures, which are the windows. And if enough of the basic properties of an object are still visible, no matter its representation, then all of the appropriate neural populations down the line can still be activated. Now, this is a very simplified version of what is probably going on in the brain during object recognition. Um, there are connections within and connections between many of the brain regions that I've just talked about. Within the cortex itself, or within the ventral stream itself, the lower levels of the stream will send information to the higher levels, but the higher levels will also send information reciprocally back to you know, organize and update new coming information to the lower levels. The flow isn't strictly one-directional, but bi-directional as well. There are also connections to subcortical brain regions from the different levels of this hierarchy that can both send and receive signals to update the object recognition process in real time. After all, in the real world, object recognition doesn't happen when you're alone in a dark room and the only thing going on is a still image of the object that you're looking at, right? A lot of times you're walking around, or the object is moving and you have to follow it. Or maybe there's other objects that you have to ignore. There's a whole bunch of other processes that could be going on. A whole bunch of other behavioral systems that have to sync up with the object recognition system in real time in order for you to do this appropriately. Together, all of this means that object recognition isn't just limited to one simple system like the ventral stream, but that it relies on syncing up with a whole bunch of other behavioral systems, and that all of these systems go through constant information update. And some of these other systems involve brain regions like the striatum, the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the prefrontal cortex. How these neuronal populations in the ventral stream come to recognize specific types of visual information as identifiable objects is a combination of how they are connected with the retina, as well as how learning induces plasticity in the cortex as we develop and learn and grow as children. So, I hope that this video was helpful in your understanding of object recognition, and if you like my videos, please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.